One of the things that I did when I was here at Villanova is I directed the Theology Institute, so I've spent many an afternoon in this very room with some of my own students having been required to attend to come and hear talks and uh, <coughs> more than once during the course of those lectures given by people I had brought to campus, I would sit in my seat and cringe thinking, do they not realize that this is principally an undergraduate audience and could they stop delivering a paper that was written as though it were to be presented in a professional scholarly society, right, a guild uh, situation. And so with that in mind, um, I'm not usually one to do PowerPoint, but I created PowerPoint and I'm going to work loosely from, um, from that and I'll pander shamelessly to you at a couple of um, opportunities um, to try to keep things lively. Um, let me just say one quick thing about why I decided when they asked me, I was allowed to talk on anything I wanted, and I decided I was going to talk on the notion of goodness and holiness or ethics and spirituality. Uh, and the, the reason why is essentially I, I'm interested in um, the things that we do that are mistaken, or wrong, uh, imperfect, flawed. How do we talk about these things? How do we name them? How do we know that they are departures from what ought to be the case? Um, these things interest me. Um, they interest me as an academic. They interest me as a parent, as somebody who has to somehow try to do that naming and that work with young children without like crushing their idea of who they are, uh, but still trying to teach them right from wrong. Um, but also I'm interested in uh, increasingly in a, a set of um, issues that kind of intersected the boundary between <coughs> morality, moral psychology, and spirituality. And so the talk was an opportunity for me to try to, um, in a sense, um, make up some of the distance between some specific topics I'd been pursuing and larger thinking about how ethics and spirituality relate to each other. So that's it. Um, a talk on uh, Goodness and holiness at a Catholic university has to start with the Second Vatican Council. So Vatican II ran from 1962 to 1965. <clears throat> it was um, a period in which Catholic theology and practices of the Catholic Church underwent a great transformation. Um, in terms of moral theology, prior to the Second Vatican Council, the way that the Catholic Church tended to look at the moral life was increasingly in terms of particular uh, analysis of particular sorts of actions, their rightness or wrongness, um, and uh, there was definitely what one might call a kind of two-level ethic in effect, a sense that um, people who were committed to the priesthood, to clerical life, or to consecrated religious life were kind of called to a loftier um, moral vocation than um, those plain John and Janes in the, the pew with their large gaggles of, of kids. One of the um, most significant things that came out of Vatican II with respect to ethics, or moral theology as it's sometimes called, was the universal call to holiness. So Lumen Gentium refers to one of the documents, official documents of Vatican II. And in chapter five of Lumen Gentium, um, that chapter articulates the notion that all people, regardless of their state, regardless of um, their, their rank, are called to holiness. So holiness isn't something reserved for you know, the few and the proud. Holiness is a vocation, an obligation, that is incumbent upon every person. Uh, that image isn't very helpful, but here's the first time I'm going to try to pander to you shamelessly. We'll see if anybody recognizes this clip, if I can get it to, uh, if I can get it to play. <coughs> At the top, oh, the top. There we go. Okay. There, now there's no sound. <laughs> There we go. Pull it. You want to pull it back to the beginning? Or? No, it's okay. <laughs> Anybody know this movie? Yes? Monty Python and the Holy Grail, right? 
here is a silly example of an understanding of holiness, right? That um, the universal call to holiness really contrasts. Now, don't you want to just stay right here and start working our way through all these Monty Python, Monty Python clips? Um, but so, so here's a conception of holiness which is, um, which is limited. Can I go back? All right, now what did I not do? This is my. Sorry. Yeah, I clicked on that. Okay. So this is a conception of holiness that, again, what we've got are monks. They're engaged in this bizarre practice, um, austere practice of self-flagellation, right? They're walking along, they're chanting, they're hitting themselves in the head with, with planks. It's a conception of holiness that the universal call to holiness really sort of challenges, that it counters. Um, the universal call to holiness doesn't only emphasize that holiness is something to which all Christians are called, therefore doing away with the two-level ethic, but it's also an affirmation that holiness is something that we pursue in the ordinary circumstances of life, right? It's a recognition that whether you're changing a poopy diaper or um, you're balancing the books at work or um, you are uh, voting, right, that the ordinary circumstances of our lives are sites where we can be attentive to the presence of God and where we can be sanctified by the presence of God active in our, our lives. Now, part of the problem, though, even with this universal call to holiness, is that it's not at all clear what holiness or goodness even mean. Right? Um, these words don't have a lot of traction or content for us today, particularly the word holiness. So what I want to do is start with an example or a couple comments about our contemporary context. Then I want to talk about goodness and holiness as two overlapping and yet distinct um, normative ideals. Uh, and then I want to talk about imperfection, particularly um, moral imperfection. And I want to see what difference those two ideas, goodness and holiness, uh, what different perspectives they might give us uh, when we think about the reality of imperfection. So, our contemporary context. Let me start with a couple observations. The first thing is that our contemporary context is marked by the rise of so-called nuns. Uh, nuns refer to those people, according to the Pew Report, who report no particular religious affiliation whatsoever. One-fifth of all Americans and one-third one of those under 30 identify themselves as nuns, that is, as having no particular religious affiliation. That doesn't mean they're all atheists or agnostic. In fact, most of them, right, 68% of them, report that even though they have no particular religious affiliation, they believe in God, however God is understood. 37% of them describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. 21% of them say they pray every day. Uh, and 88%, so the overwhelming majority of them, say they are not looking for the right religion. In other words, the nuns aren't people who want formal affiliation with a religious tradition, but just haven't found the right religious tradition yet. They're not at all interested in a formal affiliation with a religious tradition. So they can believe in God, be spiritual but not religious, and pray every day, right? Um, completely free from the trappings of institutionalized religion. In addition to this rise of nuns, people who are not affiliated with any particular um, organized religion, uh, another feature of our contemporary context that I think is closely related to this is what the sociologist Christian Smith has called moralistic therapeutic deism, which is a pretty fancy right, title. Um, moralistic therapeutic deism is his description of the kind of religious and moral sensibility of young people that he studied um, back in 2005. The main tenets of, so this is you, right? This supposedly is a picture or portrait of your generation and the kind of religious and moral sensibility that college students like you have to offer. 
So the main tenets of moralistic therapeutic deism are um, a God exists who created and orders the world and watches over human life. So there's some affirmation that God is real, right? Um, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other. And this is something that's taught in the Bible, but also in most major world religions. The central goal of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life, except when he is needed to resolve a problem. Um, good people go to heaven when they die. Anybody know that image? What's that movie from? Or what movie is that from? Dogma. Dogma, yes, that's Buddy Jesus. A little pixelated, but that's Buddy Jesus. Um, so the, the, what moralistic therapeutic deism boils down to is a sense that happiness requires goodness. But what goodness means on this count is really something like being kind, being nice, being pleasant, being courteous, right? Um, being basically responsible, right? So you're not habitually late for work. So um, it's saying thank you to the lady in the cafeteria line who hands the food over to you. It's maybe occasionally letting a driver in front of you. You don't murder and you don't commit adultery or do those really, really horrible things. You're basically a nice person, right? Moralistic therapeutic deism, in addition to having this understanding of goodness, it's basically niceness, right? Is also therapeutic. Right? The point of being good and the point of some sort of belief in God right, or being spiritual but not religious right, um, is about feeling good, it's about feeling happy, it's about feeling safe. Right? So what morality and spirituality do is they're somehow indexed to your subjective well-being, right? the sense that you have a good life, a life that's satisfying and gratifying, and certainly a life that doesn't make you uncomfortable in any way. And then finally, um, in moralistic therapeutic deism, God is not particularly involved in one's life, right? Um, especially when you don't really want God to be involved in your life. So God keeps a fairly safe distance. Another feature of our contemporary context that I want to note um, is the impact that social media has on conceptions of identity. There was a piece that ran in the New Yorker magazine recently on the topic of personal branding. Uh, and basically it was um, arguing that in an age of social media, all your online interaction um, is a matter of personal branding. So when you apply for a college, people can look you up on social media and get an idea about you, in addition to all your application materials. When you apply for a job, people can look you up and get an idea about you, in addition to whatever else you've submitted by way of um, application. Right? Um, somebody's thinking about dating you, they can look you up, and so on and so forth. There's something the New Yorker article was discussing, particularly tyrannous about personal branding though, right? Because who you are online is increasingly coming to be who you are, period. Everything you do that is somehow captured online, whether it's a selfie you post or you're tagged in somebody else's picture, everything you do online either reinforces your personal brand, right? Who you are that's distinctive from who everybody else is. Or it somehow betrays that personal brand. It weakens it, it dilutes it. And you know what? That makes you less distinctive and that makes you less trustworthy. And now all of a sudden the admissions officer or the employer or whatever isn't quite sure they know who they're getting. And so I pulled out a couple of quotes, for instance, from this article. Every time you fail, you dent your brand slightly. Enough failures and you'll wreck your brand. So what might seem like a funny picture right now, you and a bunch of friends and glasses and silly clothes and things like that, which in our age, pre-digital pictures, you could just tear up or burn or, or bury in the attic somewhere, now has permanency online. And so it was ha-ha funny in high school, but in seven years, it might not be so funny when you're applying for that job. How does that dent your personal brand? Do you need to start thinking about your personal brand and your online persona earlier and earlier and earlier? Right? 
Where's the room for mistakes? Where's the room for indiscretion? Once you create a personal brand, everything you do is branding. This includes what you drive, it includes what you wear, it includes how your home looks, where you dine, what pages you like, right? what, what articles or, um, um, or links you share, uh, the songs that you're clearly listening to on Spotify or things like that, right? your Netflix viewing history, if that's linked up somehow and shared on accounts, everything becomes a record of who you are. And then everything that has become part of this record of who you are is subject to judgment. Does it meet your personal brand? Does it not meet your personal brand? Okay. And how do you revamp and revise that as you mature and as you change when it somehow has this digital permanency? So to perfect the total image of an impressive life, increasingly, right, as our personas are available online, to perfect this image of having an impressive life, what we have to do more and more is prune what we present. It's like all of a sudden we all work for museums, right, and we have to curate our own online persona. You need to somehow get rid of, disavow, hide right, those portions of your life which are less than ideal, which you don't want to be depicted for everyone else, your 1,073 friends, right, to see or to consume. And so in an age of social media and with people more and more talking about the very idea of personal branding, we live in an era that has made it increasingly difficult to deal with imperfection. One way to sum up these features of our contemporary context might be to talk about how we live under a norm, um, a sense of obligation, a norm of self-realization. Moralistic therapeutic deism is about um, a, an approach to life which is focused on my being happy, right? Um, and I'm happy only by being moral in the sense of being nice. Uh, and I'm spiritual, if I'm spiritual at all, only to the extent that right, it helps me feel good about myself. Um, I pursue a particular image or persona that I want to cultivate and to present to others uh, in an increasingly consumption-driven format or venue um, <clears throat> so that who I am is defined by the image that I want people to believe is true of me. Okay, so does that sound at all recognizable as a contemporary context? Okay, so if we want to talk about goodness and holiness, which I imagine are not words that would be easy for you to define, if I just randomly called on someone and asked you to, I, I suspect there'd be some tripping over the tongue as you took a stab at it. But goodness and holiness name two other norms or normative ideals besides self-realization, and they can challenge the way we think about self-realization. So we'll start with goodness. Um, there are all sorts of depictions of goodness, definitions of goodness. There's real plurality about this. There's no one particular way that goodness looks. Good people, right, come in radically different shapes and sizes, and I think this is wonderful and good. So I'm not seeking to try to reduce that plurality and that diversity of the, the many manifestations that goodness can take. Um, but I will, just for the sake of trying to zero in, um, speak to a particularly durable, long-lasting conception of goodness that comes from the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition. Um, this is a tradition of, of thought in which goodness has been understood in terms of conformity to some objective moral order. That could be God's will, that could be um, um, you know, particularly agnostic about the question of God, but basically it's the idea that there is um, something to the claim that human beings have a nature that makes them distinctive from other sorts of creatures, and that if we look at features of our nature, we find reference points for the kinds of persons we ought to be the kind of life we ought to be living, that it would be good for us to have. And so goodness has to do with somehow sussing out and trying to actualize 
right? Um, our potentialities as human beings. This certainly includes um, developing a virtuous character, right? Um, virtues refer to those habits or dispositions that um, dispose us to be affected in ways that are fitting, that dispose us to act well. And so in an Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, goodness has a lot to do with the kind of character you have, right? The kind of person that you are. But it also has to do with the way that you act. Do you act in ways that are ordered toward your good, toward the good of others? Are your relationships ordered toward that flourishing of you and of other human beings in relationship with one another? An Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, um, in that tradition, the notion of goodness also um, includes what we could call both negative and positive duties. It's an idea of goodness that involves certain constraints that wants to say there are certain things human beings shouldn't do, there are certain things that are actually destructive of human well-being, that are contrary to nature, so there are limits on what we can do, but there are also positive duties. There are things we should do. There are ways that we can build up well-being, ways we can actively contribute to or pursue human flourishing. Uh, and then finally, um, it's a tradition in which goodness is understood. That's what grace perfects nature down there at the bottom of the slide means. Goodness is understood not to be contrary to who we are, but to be compatible with it. And so if you're working with a theistic version right, of this notion of goodness, it's not as though God somehow supervenes and you know, changes your hardwiring or something like that, but rather what grace does is it perfects the nature that God has given you. Um, the reference to Susan Wolfe's um, Moral Saints is, um, refers to an article by the philosopher Susan Wolfe who... Um, was tackling a notion of, of goodness um, in which she said, I don't know any good people, basically, and I wouldn't want to know any good people because what fun would they be? And they'd be dour and boring and uptight and so on and so forth. And so she criticizes this idea of goodness. That's not an idea that's consistent with the notion that, that grace perfects nature or that goodness is somehow compatible uh, with our nature. It's also the case that a conception of goodness um, takes its reference points not only from um, some notion of human nature and the flourishing of human beings who are created in just that way. Um, the notion of goodness for Christians also takes its pattern after the Paschal mystery, right? The suffering, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's an imitatio Christi, an imitation of Christ. And so goodness follows that pattern. It involves a dying to self, right? It involves um, emerging into a, a, a life, a new life, uh, that is marked by self-giving. Goodness in this sense for Christians is gratuitous, and it's gratuitous in two ways. It's gratuitous in one sense because it's excessive, it's subversive, it's countercultural. It is an idea that um, is radically inclusive. It's a manner of life that is generous, that is compassionate at precisely the moments compassion doesn't seem to be warranted or justified. Right? This is a notion of goodness that is um, far more interesting and far more demanding than moralistic therapeutic deisms. Be nice, be courteous, right? be polite, be responsible. Um, goodness in this sense is gratuitous in a second way. Um, it's a gift. It's not a human achievement. This is not something that we set about kind of directly trying to pursue. I think I'll be good and I'm going to make myself good and this somehow is supposed to happen by our own powers. It doesn't work that way. And that brings us to holiness because there's a real point of contact. If we're talking about the imit imitation of Christ, if we're talking about somehow dying to self and being reborn as these new creations and so on, um, we're getting to uh, the point where goodness and holiness intersect with each other. But because nobody uses this word anymore, right, <coughs> holiness, um, no one talks about being holy or a desire to be holy or what holiness is or what holiness looks like, it might be better to start by sort of suggesting what holiness isn't. Um, holiness is not perfection. Saints are people who are deeply flawed. Saints are people who do bad things, right? Um, 
even while they might be doing morally heroic things. Holiness is not about perfection. And we'll say more about that. Holiness isn't otherworldly either. It's not, oh, I'm going to spend all my time in some sort of lofty um, or, or ascetic form of prayer, and I'm going to reject the world and everything that has to do with it. I think I'll go live in a cave somewhere. Not that solitude, and I'll say something about that, right, isn't important and so on. But holiness isn't something that, that, is, um, that is meant to um, position us uh, over against, right, the world that we, that we live in. It's meant to draw us more deeply into it. Holiness is not principally about purity, especially purity of a sexual sort. Um, that's not what it's about. That doesn't mean that purity doesn't have something to do with it, or the notion of, of somehow wanting to safeguard um, um, portions of oneself, or, um, um, or, or uh, being discerning about the kinds of things you let into your life or, or influence you isn't part and parcel of, of, of holiness. Um, but certainly the idea that to be holy, what that principally, centrally means is a kind of sexual purity would be a gross distortion of holiness. And holiness isn't about overt religiosity. So it's not as though if you pray the rosary, that automatically makes you holy. It's not as though if you don't pray the rosary and don't even know how to pray the rosary and haven't ever even seen a rosary, except maybe if you saw a picture of Madonna from a long time ago or something like that, right, that you can't be holy. So it's not principally about overt religiosity. That guy's Thomas Merton, by the way, who's a pretty good writer on the topic of holiness. Um, he said in a book called Life and Holiness, a holy person is one who is sanctified by the presence and action of God in him. He looks like a pretty nice guy, right? I don't know exactly what that means. A holy person is one who is sanctified by the presence and action of God in him. That's not as clear as it might be. Let's try to get a better idea. Lady Gaga. See more pandering. She looks really scary there. Um, Holiness has something to do with self-acceptance. But it has to do with self-acceptance of a particular sort. Um, Lady Gaga says, you know, I was born this way, right? Um, and I think that sometimes um, the idea of self-acceptance, when linked to a, hey, I was born this way, um, can actually become not self-acceptance, but a kind of self-protective maneuver where we say, this is who I am, and if you don't like me, well, haters going to hate, right? Your problem. Haters going to hate. So it's an attempt to somehow suggest that we're immune from criticism. If you have a problem with me, that's really your problem. It's not my problem at all. You couldn't possibly say anything legitimate, right, about how I might need to change my life or mature as a person or reevaluate my priority. It's just haters going to hate, right? And I don't, I don't have time to deal with, with that. Right? Um, so we're not talking about a kind of self-acceptance that wants to say there's absolutely nothing wrong with you at all and everything you're doing is wonderful and if people don't like it, that's just too bad for them. Rather, the kind of self-acceptance that holiness involves is a rather arduous relinquishment of false conceptions of ourselves. The kinds of conceptions of ourselves that are driven by our ego, um, by our need to feel important, to feel liked, to feel acknowledged, to feel appreciated, by our need to um, have some kind of social security and status, the kinds of false conceptions of self that we get from consumerism, where we're pretty much sold prepackaged versions. You can be the hipster, or you can be the geek, or you can be this, or you can be that. It's like Breakfast Club all over again. Right. Um, it, 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 the kinds of false conceptions that could come from um, an unmerciful moralism that has us locked in patterns of guilt or shame. The kinds of false conceptions um, that can come from um, some of the worst impulses of organized religion. So we have to slay these, we have to relinquish these false conceptions of ourselves. And instead, we need to try to grow into and to embrace an understanding of our, our identity that comes from God.
Well, there are different ways that thinkers can talk about this. Um, the theologian James Allison, for instance, talks about this death to a false understanding of oneself and this sort of resurrection or new life we find in a better or more truthful understanding of oneself as being freed from the grip of what he calls mimetic rivalry, which is basically a sense that who I am is somebody I define over against who you are. I'm not the sort of person who would wear my hair like that or who would dress that way or who would drive that car or who would see that movie or who would listen to that music or who would major in that or who would live in that particular place. That's not who I am. I wouldn't vote for that person. And so an identity that's, that's cultivated and developed over against others, right? Allison thinks that our sanctification, our growth into holiness, looks something like freedom from that need to secure our superiority by defining ourselves over against others. James Cone, the um, African-American uh, theologian, talks about this emergence into a new identity, this process of sanctification, uh, in terms of becoming black like God is black. And so he talks about blackness and whiteness in terms of false conceptions of self and um, <coughs> divine conceptions of oneself. And to become holy is to become black. So there are all sorts of ways that one could, could somehow parse out this, this development, this transformative um, process. That said, I think we can say that at least a partial list of what holiness involves would have to therefore include real vulnerability and real honesty. Whereas in moralistic therapeutic deism, right, what it means to be spiritual but not religious is maybe to believe in God and to pray every day and to be nice, but that's kind of it. Um, in Christian tradition, what's required of us is actually um, depth, not surface presentation. What's required of us is the discipline to be still, to be silent, um, a readiness to die to social conceptions of oneself, to let go of the sorts of things that help us feel secure, that help us feel acknowledged, appreciated, better than others, right? That help us feel cool or whatever. Um, Holiness involves an increasing love for others. As we are gradually freed from the need to somehow mark out our identity over against others, as we are gradually freed from a concern that we have to make ourselves good, uh, we are freed to love other people and to accept who they are in freedom rather than to try to manipulate them into being who we want them to be. Holiness is a lifelong labor. This is not something anyone ever possesses in full, but rather it's something that um, continues to unfold over the span of a, of a human life. There's lots of overlap then between goodness and holiness as ideas. Um, I think both of them are friendly to uh, very pluralistic attempts to depict them and describe them. They both involve a kind of self-realization, but not the self-realization that seems to be characteristic of our contemporary context. Um, goodness is arguably <coughs> ingredient to holiness. It's something that's important, um, but isn't sufficient for it. Growth in holiness could very well bring about or yield continued growth in goodness, um, but again, without ever achieving the fullness of, of goodness. Both goodness and holiness name ideals that we can't aim at directly. Um, we can't set about saying, I want to be good or I want to be holy and then somehow accomplish or bring about these through our own bootstrapping efforts. Um, they both entail an ongoing conversion, an attempt to be remade. So that brings us to this idea of moral imperfection or just imperfection. Um, the reason why I wanted to think about what difference, if any, these two ideas, goodness and holiness, make when we think about imperfection has a large part to do with um, our contemporary context and I think what is a growing hostility towards the presence of imperfection in our lives. Um, but also because I think that the language of imperfection is broader than simply talking about wrongdoing. It can include that. 
uh, but it's not limited to it. There are all sorts of things that we can feel guilty about or that we can be ashamed of, which are not properly speaking uh, moral decisions or moral wrongs. Um, maybe you can't forgive yourself for um, um, not being in a position to care for an aging parent. Right? Maybe you feel incredible shame about the severe acne that you had, <laughs> right, uh, as a teenager. Um, maybe you um, um, have never quite got over um, uh, being dumped by a loved one or betrayed by a loved one. Um, maybe you've been victimized or assaulted and you feel ashamed of that even though it's not your fault that it happened. Um, so there are all sorts of ways in which um, things sort of mar our lives that aren't necessarily properly moral, but they also include moral, and that's why I like the language of imperfection. Um, when it comes to imperfection, ethics traffics in moral judgments, right? I mean, it's the work of ethics to hold up ideals and to try to name um, um, not just manifestations or realizations of these ideals, but also departures from them. Um, recognize Harry Potter there? It's the seven deadly sins. Um, I'm not going to say anything about the seven, de seven deadly sins in, in particular or Harry Potter. Um, but the notion of seven deadly sins is an example of the kind of work ethics can do, right? Um, it's, it's fitting and appropriate to judge, to delineate, to say, here's where something's been transgressed, or this is wrong, right? This ought not to happen. This is bad for people to do, right? And it's the task of ethics not just to hold up ideals for us to try to live into and emulate, but also to help us identify and talk about and warrant those instances where we want to name that something wrong has happened, that something is not what it ought to be. That notion of goodness that we got from an Aristotelian Thomistic tradition gives us all sorts of ways, all sorts of tools for thinking about how we might name or describe imperfection, right? As a kind of privation or diminishment of our being. Um, language of sin that can help us think about sin as multi-directional and as relational, right? We can sin horizontally against each other and we can do that in interpersonal relationships but also in social structures and so on. Um, we sin vertically against God. We sin reflexively in the sense that all my sin embroils me more deeply in a kind of self-contradiction that um, is damaging to me. We can talk about vices in character and bad relationships and wrong actions and all that, that good stuff. One of the things I want to suggest, though, is that the language of goodness, while it can be countercultural, while it certainly can um, give us more material to work with than that which is provided by spiritual but not religious or moralistic therapeutic deism, to the extent that at least an Aristotelian Thomistic idea of goodness is somehow linked to an account of the person, linked to an account of um, human flourishing and so on, um, I think it can remain vulnerable to simply reinforcing the status quo, to reflecting our cultural ideas about what a good life means. And also, it can keep alive the sense that the point of life is to fix ourselves that the point of life is somehow to keep getting better, to keep doing better. My, um, my, my eldest son has a religion test on Thursday. It was moved back one day. It was supposed to be tomorrow. But because the Pittsburgh Pirates are in the playoffs for the first time in 21 years, he got right a moment of grace. And, but I was looking at his book um, yesterday to start reviewing for him before I, 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 I left to come out here. And in one little reflection section where he was supposed to write something about, you know, the, the gospel and all that, he wrote just one line, help me to behave better. And I thought, oh, that's so sad. I mean, yeah, I want him to behave. I want him to, you know, pick up his socks the first time I ask him to pick them up or things like that. But the notion that somehow, is that what religion, is that the conception of religion that he's starting to get? Is that the idea that somehow... What it means to come to know Jesus is to constantly feel like I should be doing better, I should be doing better, I should be doing better, right? 
And so conceptions of goodness, because they link to ideas of flourishing, can somehow sustain a norm of perfection, a norm of self-realization, in ways that could prove problematic, which, again, can be fitting in their time and place, but could also prove problematic. Uh, and I think this is particularly the case in a context where we've got nuns on the rise um, and moralistic therapeutic deism as part of our cultural <coughs> climate. So we think about holiness as a normative idea. I think what we get is a different perspective on imperfection. As a normative idea, what I would argue is holiness will inscribe imperfection into the context of an invitation to a deeper relationship with God. So you don't look at imperfection through the lens of how does this fall short of what ought to be the case. You look at imperfection and say, how is God present in this? How is this, how is entering into this, how is embracing this, how is confronting this, how is dealing with this, not fixing it, but just confronting it, how is this an opportunity to come to know the presence and action of God in my life? So it, the work of spirituality isn't judgment, it's invitation. Holiness, we might say then, is rather opportunistic. Right? There isn't anything, there isn't anything that can't function as this opportunity to be drawn into deeper relationship to be drawn into um, uh, a relinquishment of your false ideas of self, right? Uh, and an identity which is given to you as somebody who's fine, right? Um, who's loved, imperfect and all, right, by God. So opportunistic that our sin, our wrongdoing, our worst moments are these opportunities. Uh, in the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 12, St. Paul says this thing that um, has vexed me for quite a long time. He writes about how um, he, um, he struggles with something. He doesn't say what it is wisely, right? He doesn't say, I'm bulimic, or <laughs> he doesn't say, I have a gambling problem, or I can't stop visiting the prostitutes, or anything like that. He didn't tell us what it is, but he says... You know, um, I keep praying. I prayed and prayed to God to get rid of this, to release me from this. I just can't seem to get past this flaw of mine, right? And he says, finally, what he realizes is God is sort of saying to him, um, you know what? It's in your weakness that you can know my strength. And he says, so I'm going to boast of my weakness. And for years, I've looked at that passage and thought, I don't get that at all. Why would you boast of your weakness? Why would you celebrate your flaws? Why would you befriend your wounds, right? Or things like that. And um, <clears throat> one example that might be a little bit friendlier uh, is the character of Sebastian Rodriguez. Have any of you read Shusaku Endo's novel, Silence? It's a good, it's a good, good read, right? So Sebastian Rodriguez um, undergoes... Um, He's a, he's a missionary who goes um, to Japan to try to minister to Christians, underground Christians who are being persecuted. Um, and basically he's, he's confronted with the decision of whether or not to apostatize, whether or not to renounce his, his faith um, or not. And it's a wonderful story that raises the possibility that at the very moment that Sebastian Rodriguez falls short of his ideals, the moment he most betrays what he has thought is his vocation, the moment that he fails in the most spectacular and public way possible, that's the moment that he comes to know who God is more truly than he ever has before. It's a novel worth reading. Right? Shusako Endo, silent. So, all right. As a normative ideal, then, what I think um, goodness does, at least in some intellectual traditions, is it can refer us back to conceptions of flourishing in ways that could undercut the critical power of goodness. And I want to say again, I think this is a notion of goodness that is far richer and far better than you know, the pale substitutes that currently circulate um, in um, popular culture. Um, 
but goodness, I think, remains somehow beholden to the idea that to the extent we're not yet as good as we could be, there's work to be done. Holiness, though, isn't like that. Holiness is not about fixing us. It is not a project of self-improvement. Holiness may very well involve healing, reconciliation, personal integration, right? Um, but the aim or the central project of holiness is not to fix or improve us. Holiness names, in other words, a form of self-realization that is free from the illusion of perfection. Um, now, in some ways, the differences, I've tried to overdraw them and simplify them and everything, um, but let me just say one last thing about what all this could mean um, for how we understand ethics in relationship to um, spirituality. It seems to me that each has something to contribute to the other. Um, I think that spirituality, both lived spirituality and spirituality as an academic discipline, um, can assist ethics in the task of judging character traits, judging actions, normatively evaluating relationships, and so on. Uh, and it can assist ethics by anchoring those judgments in a compassionate and humble recognition that nothing can separate us from the love of God. In other words, if part of the reason people want to be spiritual but not religious is because it seems like what religion does is offer a morality that has nothing to do with grace but everything to do with guilt-mongering, right, um, and with rather sort of um, vindictive and soul-crushing uh, forms of judgment, what spirituality can do is anchor right, um, moral discrimination, moral discernment, um, in a more compassionate and humble recognition um, that precisely when we are farthest from God, God is closest to us. Uh, and then ethics can assist um, spirituality. It can work in the other direction um, by informing spirituality, both lived spirituality and spirituality as an academic discipline or a reflective form of inquiry. Um, by informing it with wisdom from religious traditions, by facilitating our discernment about what, say, ideas of false selves and true selves might mean, and so on and so forth. Um, and also by linking spirituality to the pursuit or the development of communal and structural well-being. In other words, if spiritual, not religious, um, <clears throat> is to be improved um, in one crucial way, I think I would suggest that crucial improvement has something to do with recognizing the importance of anchoring spiritual growth in a community that holds you accountable, a concrete community that holds you accountable. And so I think ethics can help um, to recover uh, some of the importance of um, making sure that what it means to be spiritual but not religious is um, to be um, isolated uh, and disconnected from communities that assist you in coming to know the falseness of some conceptions and where you might find or get in touch with uh, a more truthful understanding of who you are. Okay. That's it. Questions, conversation? Let's talk. I think it plays a vital role. Um, I think that um, particularly when it comes to growth in the spiritual life, um, but also with regard to morality, 
um, I think growth in goodness and holiness alike have a lot to do with having to confront reality. And when we surround ourselves with people who think like us and people who won't judge us and people who um, support us in all that we do, um, when we shop for communities <laughs> Um, because we want to be in an environment that is comfortable and hospitable, um, I think what we do is we insulate ourselves from um, those people, those perspectives, which can call us into um, a deeper life, um, which can help us to appreciate um, the ways in which we've got blinders on, <laughs> or the ways in which we enjoy privilege that we don't recognize, right, and things like that. Um, but also, there's something about being linked to a concrete community which is comprised of people who you don't always like and you don't always agree with that forces you to move outside yourself, right, um, and to recognize that your well-being is linked with the well-being of a community of others, um, and that there's not perfect consonance between those two, not on this side, right? Um, and so it, it seems to me that one of the, while I, I am sympathetic to the sorts of things that make people want to be spiritual but not religious, um, I think that the, the allergic reaction to involvement with an actual community, right? A tradition, a worshiping community, um, can turn into a form of spirituality and a form of morality that is totally bourgeois, <laughs> that, that, that um, doesn't actually set you up for any kind of growth or maturation. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say is, I, I think this is the sort of thing that Pope Francis is talking about. Um, when he, so he gives this big, long interview, right? And of all the many, many words in the interview, the seven or 12 words that everybody gets all bent out of shape over is um, Francis saying we're obsessed with, uh, we're obsessed with you know, gay marriage and contraception and you know, all that, that stuff. Um, he also says things like, I can say one thing that is dogmatically true, and that's that God is in everyone. <laughs> right? I mean, I think what he is trying to do is say um, that the reality of Christianity has to do with an encounter with Jesus, right? Not with the institutional church. Now, the institutional church is, is a crucial site in which we can, in which that encounter with Jesus can occur, right? Um, but when he said, you know, I know one thing uh, as, as a dogmatic truth, and that is that God is in every person, he went on to say, it doesn't matter how many needle tracks you have on your arms, and it doesn't matter, right? So um, if God is in everybody, then everyone can have this encounter, and that encounter involves a movement into deeper interiority. But who assists us in that movement into deeper interiority, right? Um, and religious traditions offer a wealth of practices and art and reflection and rituals and to assist us in, in that. Does that mean you need to be part of organized? I, I, no, I'm not saying I'm not saying that. But I think too easy a dismissal just becomes a form of evasion. It's pretty convenient to not want to have anything to do right, um, with organized religion, because then you get a spirituality that doesn't ask anything of you. So if it's not going to be organized religion, at least go somewhere where something's being asked of you, you know, and, and I think that happens in community. So, yeah? Gerard, does this get to the point you were making that, that you can't pursue these things directly? Are you suggesting that there are disciplines involved and that, that one way to begin to understand religion and these traditions is that they introduce us to disciplines that might bring about the kind of changes you're talking about. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, again, you know, the, the language of spirituality is so murky, um, and it means any number of, 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 of things. Um, um, but it, religious traditions can remind us that spirituality has to do with disciplines, right? Um, it, it has to do with practices. Um, and central to those practices involves some sort of stillness or silence, right? The, or, or forms of paying attention. Um, and it's absolutely vital to try to create space in which um, what Marty Laird, an Augustinian here at Villanova, has called that incessant cocktail party going on in your head, all that constant chatter, right? Where that can drift away. <laughs> And you can tune that out and try to tap into something else, right? Um, so it's at, I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to raise a kid in a faith tradition, three kids in a faith tradition. So I go to church and I hear homilies and I think yawn and I think, come on, Father, do a better job. My, you know, like th th this kid's faith life is right on the line here and you're, you're killing it. You're just killing it. You're doing a terrible job. Um, and then, you know, somebody else might come in and I'd be like, wow, I wish we had him every week, right? Um, because it, at least he's talking in a way that I think is life-giving and, uh, and, and, and so on. So, yeah, there are all sorts of things about organized religion that are boring, things that are um, 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 empty. Um, there are people who represent those religions who can scar us in all sorts of ways. That's absolutely true. Um, but we're also talking about intellectual traditions, artistic traditions, cultural traditions that have been around for millennia uh, and have a lot more depth and richness and things to offer um, than they're often given, given credit for. So, yeah. so if, I'm, if I'm an undergraduate student sitting here, what's wrong with being nice and kind? Like, oh. what, 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 like, why do I have to do all this work? I'm mean, gonna have to work hard to get a job. I have to work hard to raise my family. I have to work hard. You're asking me to work hard on this. What, what's in it? What's, what's the payoff? <clears throat> and you can dispute the terms of the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm trying to imagine, because I get what you're saying, but I can imagine someone like, what is going on here? Why should I do all this hard work? Um, well, I guess I wanna answer that in two ways, one's sort of instrumental, right? So let's just appeal to an instrumentalizing approach to, um, um, studies seem to, studies show that people who meditate are happier. They're smarter. Um, they have far lower levels of stress. They have healthier relationships. I mean, the psychological, and the economic, and you know, I mean, the benefits of this as a practice are documented, right? So why should you try to engage in some of that work? Well, because it'll make your life better on any number of fronts, right? Um, you'll be, it'll be easier to resolve conflicts, you'll let stuff go, you'll be, do a better job at work. That's, I mean, so there are purely instrumental reasons um, to pursue you know, spiritual disciplines that wind up having these, these effects. Um, but, you know, ultimately I think uh, there's no answer to that question apart from the non-instrumental one, which it doesn't mean that their instrumental one's the only answer. I just mean it is sort of pointless. Um, it's its own point, you know. The, um, not everybody, perhaps not everybody lets themselves hit bottom, right? But the experience that people in recovery have where they say, what I can say is that this is the truth of who I am, which is that I've made a mess and I can't fix it by myself. And I need somehow, by being accountable in a community of others, right, um, to get drawn into a different life because there's, there's nothing for me here. Right? I think there are parallels between that and why someone would do this, which is that um, I think we love in ways that aren't life-giving, even if they're passable or tolerable. I think we um, work in ways that aren't life-giving, even if we can eke out decades of employment, sustainable employment, 
right? Um, but but I, I, I finally think that um, we human beings are constituted in, in, in such a way that um, at some point or another, we peace only comes from realizing we can't fix ourselves, right? And, and that actually we don't need to do that. So, but, but that's not a cause for beating ourselves up. So that's, that's the reason for doing it too. It's hitting bottom, you know, so. Which could also, by the way, take the form of just spectacular wrongdoing. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't need to be, <laughs> doesn't need to be addiction or recovery or that sort of a thing, so, yeah. But that's not the kind of thing you can persuade anybody to do. And it's the reason why, so, you know, I tried to give some content to the idea of holiness, but um, unless you know someone holy and you've sort of had a sense of, I can see how that's true of this person that I'm thinking of when I think of someone who's holy. It's hard to attach that to reality, you know. Um, so you have to give it a try. And I think it'd be self-validating if you did. Yeah, Peter? Um, so something that's missing both in the life of the scribe of, um, of Brandon and the more contemporary ethics, I think both the kind of ethics done by people who do ethics professionally but also just thinking about ethics in the wider culture, is a sense of calling. Mm -hmm. um, so Brandon has no specific audience. It's about creating a sort of general impression of you mm -hmm. you have to carry around with you in all kinds of you know, unpredictable contexts. Mm -hmm. um, the image of ethics you get for, say, civil rights paper mm -hmm. is of somebody who's massively devoted to helping other people, but not other people in particular, just mm -hmm. as many other people as possible, whoever they might be. Mm -hmm. But I think you get both in the relative of ethics, but also in, 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 in sort of Christian sense of um, discussing holiness, a sense of holiness is something we're called to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that ties in with an image of ethics where ethics is about a particular person. So the way, he, the way we tell the story of the Good Samaritan in modern culture is, mm -hmm. is somebody helps somebody across some kind of boundary. Mm -hmm. But I think you lose a lot of the thing. Here's somebody who came across somebody and they were the person in a position of justice. And their understanding of what's expected of them isn't part of some larger project which is making the world a better place. Yeah. Like this is what we have to do. Yeah. So how does, but I, I didn't sort of get a sort of vocational language in the discussion of holiness. <coughs> is, is that crucial or is that something that no, I think that, that that's linked very deeply to the ways in which um, ideas of goodness and holiness are actually versions of self-realization. But, but where's the conception of the self that you're realizing coming from, right? Um, and so the idea of vocation or the idea of a call in, in generic Christian ways or in the particularity of who you specifically, right? Peter, with your history and your talents and your, you know, right? Um, um, I think that that fleshes that that fleshes that out. Um, the other thing I would I would say uh, is that I think one of the accompanying features of our contemporary um, situation is that we have a sense of agency which is far too small. Um, I think part and parcel of thinking that what it means to be good is to be nice and courteous and pleasant. And again, there's nothing wrong with being nice and courteous and pleasant. I'm not saying go out and be jerks, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, the, what's, that's just far too small a conception. And it's far too unimaginative about what we might be able to do. So I don't think we can fix the world. I don't think we can save the world. Um, but, uh, but I think we can do a lot more than we give ourselves credit for. Uh, and the, my favorite example of that is a woman who lived, I don't know, somewhere in the Midwest, let's say Iowa. I don't really know if it was Iowa, but she read a New York Times story about um, children who were consigned to indentured servitude, right, because their families had to borrow money. So basically, they had to work off this debt for their family, and they lived in squalid conditions, and they worked inhumane hours. And, and she was so moved by a photograph on the front page of the New York Times of this one kid that she called the reporter to find out how she could help. 
And basically, she went around her community and she raised enough money. It was only a few hundred dollars. I mean, it was not exorbitant amounts of money. But she raised money to um, buy out his right, time of service um, so he could go to school. This is, an or this is a soccer mom. This isn't a hero. This isn't Martin Luther King. This isn't a pope. This is an ordinary person, right, who had the imagination to look at a story and not just go, oh, that's too bad, or, and I just can't deal with that unpleasantness, but to, say, but to actually pick up the phone and find out if there was something that, to do and then say to some kids, maybe you don't do soccer camp right now because there's, <laughs> there's another kid, right, who who's living this kind of life, and we can't get rid of this practice altogether, but we could do something about this one kid, right? Um, so I think our sense of, of um, you know, or think about, so you make a family, and you make a family with biological children. Why can't you also bring in somebody who doesn't have a home? Why not? Should everyone do that? I'm not saying that at all, right? But can we imagine that there are options that our culture doesn't present to us as typical, right? And, and I think that takes a sense of agency that is um, being fed and nourished from other sources, right? Um, and is, is, and, and is, is enlivened by a community of people who also help you think about that, who ask you things like, how are you doing when it comes to helping people who are radically less fortunate than you? And when was the last time you really looked at how you spent your money and, and so on? So I agree with you. I think a sense of calling is, is really Im, Im, important. And I think linked to that would be a sense of that our agency, our understanding of what we can do is, is far too small. Yeah, I, I just want to make I, I guess my suspicion is the problem is it's small as it's a recoiling from a sense of infinite responsibility. Yes. Yeah, just a sense of, here's the world, make it better. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we try to do? We, we, we operate in our little circle and we enrich the lives of people who are already near and dear to us and given who we are in this room are probably likely already quite privileged and well off as it is. Yeah. Well, thanks, darling, very much. Thank and you. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.